Well, good morning and welcome uh, to this, our Sunday worship service. It's good to see you this morning. Uh, today is within the calendar of the church is Trinity Sunday, which follows, of course, Pentecost, which we celebrated last Sunday. And uh, today uh, I want to address that issue uh, this morning, uh, albeit not so much from a theological and profound sort of kind of detail, uh, consideration of that doctrine, but perhaps more from a pastoral point of view, uh, but nevertheless addressing that important teaching of the Church, Trinity Sunday, which uh, again is a precious one, and today we celebrate it. Um, so let me just sort of read the following as we come to worship God as our call to worship. Uh, once again, we gather together, again we are together to sing, Again, we are here to read and to hear and to pray. And we do these things again and again every Sunday because we believe God is in all of these things. We believe God desires our worship. He does. We believe that God wants to speak to us and He does. So as we come together this morning, let us do so with great expectation. Let us set aside what we think we know and open ourselves up to that which is beyond our understanding. Let us worship God again, who loves us, who redeemed us, and who will one day return to us. In the words of the prophet Isaiah, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And so on this Trinity Sunday, we sing, if you know what I mean, we listen to the music and we read the words as we sing from our hearts this wonderful hymn, 111, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
before we come to prayer, I want to read to you a psalm. And it's a psalm which is very familiar to, I'm sure, most of us. And this is Psalm 8. And I just, uh, it's only nine verses, but I wish to read them as our call to worship for us this morning. This is a psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, and you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and all the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you have given us faith to affirm the glory of the eternal Trinity and to worship you as one. Keep us firm in this faith and safe with you forever. For you live and reign one God now and forever. Father, you who created us and redeems us and sustain us, we rejoice that you have chosen us to be your own and that you visit us and dwell with us and open to us the way to abundant life. This morning, Father, we are full of awe and wonder at what you have done and what you continue to do. By your word, the heavens and the earth were made. By the bounty of your mercy in Christ Jesus, we have been born to new life. Your Spirit fills the whole world with your loving kindness and gives us the power we need to be your witnesses and to lift up your holy name. Father, we know that we have done nothing to deserve your favor and love. From day to day and week to week, all too often we fall short of your standards. We find it easy to fail and hard to get things right, either with you or with our fellow human beings. We worry about the needs of the body, but forget the requirements of the soul and the inward needs of the heart. And so this morning we long to know the peace that only Christ can bring. Therefore, in faith, we humbly come as we are to ask for your forgiveness and for pardon for all the sins of thought, word, and deed. May we acknowledge our debt to you as we also ask for the same grace to forgive others. Show us the right way to live and protect us from all evil and bless us as we live from day to day. Father, bring us closer to you and to one another. And in our prayer, in our thanksgiving, our hearing, in our speaking, in our giving and receiving, make us more completely thine. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, and who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And now we 
hear from the Word of God, our reading for this morning. Thank you. Reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Jesus appears to his disciples. The eleven disciples went to the hill in Galilee where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, even though some of them doubted. Jesus drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have demanded of you. And I will be with you always to the end of the age. May God add his blessing to this, the reading of his holy word, and his name be praise and glory now and forever. Amen. And so before we hear the message for this morning, we once again, our hymn is 112, God Whose Almighty Word. Consider just a sample um, that reading from verse 20, uh, verses 16 to the end of that chapter of Matthew 28. Let us pray. Father, you send your word to bring us truth and your spirit to make us holy. Through them we come to know the mystery of your life. Help us to worship you, one God, in three persons by proclaiming and living our faith in you. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
There has been countless times I have said those words as I have baptized infants and indeed adults. This, of course, comes from the commandment that God, Jesus Christ, commanded his disciples and in obedience to him. These are the familiar words spoken to a child or to an adult as water is sprinkled on their head or our bodies are plunged into some pool of water. In essence, that, that sentence, those words, is a declaration of who God is. One God fulfilling three roles. And therefore, if water is a sign of the grace of God, then the Trinity is a mystery of God's nature. And so this morning, I have to confess, right from the very beginning, that I feel like I am engaging almost in an impossible task. For when we talk about the doctrine of the Trinity, we are really talking about a subject matter which is almost impossible to fully comprehend. In all my years as a Christian, seldom, and I mean seldom, I have heard lectures or sermons based on the doctrine of the Trinity. And I would be very interested to hear whether you are likewise not being exposed to this doctrine being taught and preached. You see, it has always been within the church, within the Christian community of faith, it wasn't proved, it was always assumed. It wasn't always explained, it was almost stated. It wasn't always preached, but quite happy it was always sung, as we have sung it this morning. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The reality is that within many Christian churches, congregations across this land, they say across the world, the Trinity is the doctrine we all believe but never discuss. Either we all understand it and therefore no discussion is needed or no one understands it and therefore no discussion is possible. So we are caught between a rock and a hard place and some people don't wish to talk about it. But talk, we must. Because the fact that we have failed to understand or even to engage in seeking to understand this doctrine of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the fact that we don't understand it, it doesn't mean it's not true. It is true. And it is in your interest, my interest, as Christians, to fully understand the meaning of this doctrine. Now, the reason the issue is difficult is because it is such a profound and mind-boggling topic that it requires a level of understanding that humans do not possess. In fact, most of the things we believe, we don't fully understand totally. And nowhere is that statement more true than when we come to speak of God himself. Who will be the brave man or woman to say, I understand everything about God? I'm sure there is no one here who will be so foolish to even contemplate, never mind saying it, but contemplate that even subject. The fact is, we don't fully comprehend who God really is because the moment we understand who God is, then God ceases to be God. 
God is far beyond our understanding. We will never understand him in this life, not in the one to come, ever, ever. Therefore, in spite of this, as Christians, we affirm the doctrine of the Trinity for two really good reasons. One, it is what the Bible teaches. It is there. And also, it is what the church has affirmed throughout the centuries. The creeds, for example, what do you understand the creeds to be? The creeds are confessions of faith. The creeds were put together as a response to the antagonism, the heresies, the false teachings that people created and brought about to try to discredit and undermine the Christian faith and the nature of God. The creeds were put together to defend the nature of God, to defend the teachings of Scripture, to protect the integrity of who God really is. So when we say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, we are stating a defense of that faith. And so the creeds through the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and yes, a very topical one in the, in the General Assembly, the Westminster Confession. I dread to think what they want to do with it. But I, for one, will defend it until my last breath. Because it is a conviction, a declaration that what God says he is, is true. And I, for one, must declare it. I, for one, must, must stand for it. And so the word Trinity, yes, I grant you, the word Trinity as a word is not in the Bible. So don't go to the concordance and look for it. You won't find it. That word Trinity is not in the Bible. It's not stated, no quote, nothing. But the concept of the Trinity, the idea that there is a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit is all over. What is the grace that we say sometimes at the end of the service? It's in Scripture. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, meaning the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Stay there. Here's one example. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the... It's there, isn't it? The word is not. But the truth of it is all over. There is one God. And this one God exists in three persons. The Trinity word, the word Trinity simply means triunity. That basically means three in oneness. Sometimes children, I mean, I know that we mustn't use examples like that because they're always fraught with limitations. But I remember once doing an assembly in this, in, at a school and a child says, Minister or, well, obviously, they, Mr. Avaledo, or sometimes they would call me, Reverend Benjamin, whichever way it was easier for them, you know, they called me that. But one, on one occasion, in a previous charge, someone said, can you explain to me the Trinity? And I, that, that almost blew my head off. I'm just, this is a child asking me a question about the Trinity. I mean, where did he got the idea from? His mom and dad were Christians, so I knew exactly what, where that came from. But they asked me, how would you explain the Trinity? And I have to confess to you, in a flash, in a moment of time, it was almost like God came to my aid and my help, and it gave me something to use to try to explain it. And so I use the example of the sun. We can all see the sun. We don't look at it because hopefully it, it, it will blind us, but we know the sun. It's lovely to see the sun today. But what do we get from the sun? We get light. Don't we? And we get warmed. It all comes from the same source, isn't it? And in a sense, even though it's not complete, even though it's not in its totality, the full picture, 
Nevertheless, in a language that we can all understand, including a child, we understand that from that son, we are able to receive the light and the warmth that comes from that one source. And from God himself, we receive God is the Father who created all things, who has made all things, and he has made them well. And from him comes the beloved Son, Christ Jesus, who became one of us, who stood down to our level, to our sinfulness, and became the Savior of the world. And when he went to glory, when he was ascended, he promised, I will send you the Holy Spirit that we celebrated last Sunday on Pentecost. And now he's no longer out with us, outside of us. But where is he now? Within us. God the Father, the lover, and the gracious God he is. God the Son who came to die for our sins and to bring us back to God the Father. And the Holy Spirit who convicts us of sin and who brings us near the forgiveness of sins and the very presence of God himself within us. Do you understand? Do you really appreciate how important the Trinity really is? We might not be able to understand it. I have been a student of theology pretty much since I became a Christian when I was just 19. I have studied books and books and books. I have done seven years of theology at high level. I have studied ever since to be a minister, to prepare sermons, teachings. I still cannot fully fathom it. But let me tell you this, my friends. If you try to explain the Trinity, you will lose your mind. But if you try to deny it, you will lose your soul. The truth is, the Trinity is hard to grasp because we have nothing like it in our existence. And yet, by the mercy and the grace of God, we can know, really know, the reality that God is with us. My friends, I do not understand how the God of all creation could empty himself and become the babe on Bethlehem's manger. I don't understand that. We do not understand how that crude cross erected by Roman soldiers on the top of a hill outside Jerusalem 2,000 years ago could save the world from their sins. I don't understand that. We do not understand how the God of the billions of galaxies could hear and answer the prayers of a small child kneeling beside his bed in a tiny home in the middle of nowhere. I don't understand that. And I, I probably would say that you probably cannot understand it either. How could that happen? But it happens. It's not for you to understand, my friend. Don't you perceive that it's not for you or for me to fully understand this it is for you to accept it it is for you to I don't know do something worship him bow before him acknowledge that we are totally undeserving that we are here by the grace and the mercy of God alone. 
alone, not through our merits, not through the things that we think we deserve, but simply because God dare to love you, to accept you and to welcome you as one of his children. I don't understand it. I am reminded of a quotation which goes like this, birds do not sing because they have an answer, they sing because they have a song. A song, a song of faith in him. We are not here because we have an answer. I don't have the answers, but I have the utter confidence that the God that the Bible speaks about is true, is consistent. He doesn't lie, he doesn't tell you misleading things. He is who he is. And therefore, on that basis, we know that he is the author of that song. He is the writer. He has put those lyrics there. The words and the message of that beautiful song are his. It is all by faith. And therefore, what can we say about the doctrine of the Trinity? We say, as the scripture says, for there is one God. And there is one mediator between God and man. And that is the man Christ Jesus. Or what about the Shema, who was the Jewish called that basically we find in the book of Deuteronomy, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. A reminder of the wonderful character and the nature of God. And so what can I say? Well, I did say to you, I wanted to make this message to be a kind of a pastoral, so a kind of encouraging message without bombarding you too much of the theology of it, because to be perfectly honest, I would struggle if I was to do that. But can I say to you, my friends, that God is our Father? He is our Father. Let's be honest, when life, when life is not playing game or when things are in chaos, as they often are, and we are even in chaos now, we need someone to take charge. When life is falling apart, we need a creator, a savior, to put things back together again. And so in faith and in trust, we call upon God, who is our Father. Did we not say the prayer, the Lord's prayer, our Father who art in heaven? Why do you think Jesus taught us that prayer? Because he himself called God my Father. And I know that some people may have a problem with the concept because maybe their father was not a good one. And we tend to compare what our father was in relation to what God's father who really is. A, but there is no comparison. Because the failures of your own father is not simply because God is imperfect, simply because your father was not living up to what fatherhood really ought to be. And so my friends, God our Father is the source of all life. He moves and he has his being on who he is. He is the one who sustains our life, who gives you breath, who allows you to be here this morning to worship him, not because you deserve it, but because he is gracious. He is our provider, our creator. He will meet our needs and he does meet our needs. And even when we lack something sometimes, it doesn't mean that he is not there to provide whatever we need at that moment. He will never forsake us. I'm reminded of the story of a devout Christian who was dying at the age of 87. And when his minister came to visit, the old man said, Minister, I am dying. For years I have been feasting upon the promises of God, but this morning I can't remember a single one of them. And the minister very graciously said to him, My dear friend, you have forgotten, but do you think God has forgotten the promises he made to you? I love that. I really do. 
And the reason why I love that is because I very often forget. We are forgetful, aren't we? Deliberately or not, we tend to forget. But God doesn't. God doesn't. And so what we have this morning is that God is our Father. But very quickly, I want to move to the other theme, which is God in Christ is also our older brother. This is the second part of the complex of the mystery. We read in 2 Corinthians 5, 19, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. In other words, through Christ's death on the cross and his forgiveness, he has brought people to a place of spiritual salvation and into a relationship with himself. He became one of us, as I was saying a moment or two ago. When the over 70 years of age Ronald Reagan, which I'm sure you remember, he was the president of the United States, but he, when he was campaigning for the presidency, an 80 year old woman said to him, everything you say sounds fine, Mr. Reagan, but what about us old folk? Haven't you forgotten us? Mr. Reagan smiled and said, forgotten you? Heavens, how could I ever forget you? I'm one of you. <laughs> and he was one of them. And as it happens, he wasn't too bad of a bad president, was it? But nevertheless, imperfect as it was, the message I want to use from that is the same as Christ, our Saviour. He became one of us. And my dear people, I believe that the reason why Jesus is so precious to us is because he understands us better than anybody else. He became frail in his humanity. He suffered thirst, hunger, pain, insults, beatings, persecution, and ultimately a horrific death. And why did he did that? I think you know. But I'm going to tell you again, because the love of God the Father was such that he needed to send his own son to redeem us from the penalty of sin and bring us to salvation so that we will be with him for all eternity to come. But the final thing I want to say is this, the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort and for strength. Christians find that it is not enough to say that he is our creator and sustainer. It is not even enough to say that God was in Christ. God is alive and at work in our world through the power of his Holy Spirit. He is with us, each of us, every single day. I chuckled at the story about a priest who was trying to institute some liturgical reform in his very old-fashioned parish. He was teaching then the new responses. And for those who come from either a Catholic background or Anglican tradition, very often the liturgy, you have responses. And I have been part of those things, and I do occasionally use them as well. But on this occasion, this priest, he, he said, when I say, the Lord be with you, you will reply all together and also with you. And I'm sure you're familiar with that. And then I will say, let us pray. Well, the day came for the introduction of the new liturgy. Everybody was excited. Well, he was very excited. However, something happened to the microphone. I hope nothing happens to mine this morning, but nevertheless, on this occasion, something happened to the microphone, and the priest was trying to adjust it, something he should not really do, but nevertheless, he tried, and he tried very hard, and he said in a loud voice, there is something wrong with this microphone. 
To which the congregation responded with one loud voice, and also with you. <laughs> well, I couldn't help but chuckle by the fact that really he was indeed fallible after all. But humor aside, there is something wrong with all of us, isn't it? And we know we are not perfect. But through the Holy Spirit, through Christ, God the Father as well, we can find ourselves in a place of salvation and redemption. Let me just conclude. I know I have said what I wanted to say. I can say more, but to be perfectly honest, I don't really want to say further other than what I already have said. But let me just conclude with this uh, particular uh, story. We are told that Gainsborough was, as you know, he was an artist and longed also to be a musician. And on this particular occasion, Gainsborough bought a musical instrument of many kinds and tried to play them. But once when, when he heard of a great violinist who brought beautiful music from his instrument, Gainsborough bought the violin on which the master plays so beautifully. And surely he thought, if I have the wonderful instrument, I will be able to play too. But he soon learned that the music was not in the violin. It was in the violinist. He understood, it doesn't matter what you have, my dear friend. At the end of the day, whatever it is that we have, good as it may well be, will never replace the wonderful, masterful stroke of the Master himself, who makes all things beautiful in his time. And so, my dear friends, the message of the Trinity, he is there all over, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We don't have the answers to everything. We follow him not because we like the direction that sometimes he gives us, but we follow him because we trust the ever-living one. To see what we don't see, to understand what we don't understand, and to lead us to a fellowship with him that is greater and more fulfilling that our minds can comprehend. And so the final question is this, how can three be made in one? I don't know. I don't need to know. The scripture affirms it. But you know what? The reality of God within us answers those questions. Christ in me, as the Bible says, the hope of glory. And my friends, I look forward when in the presence of God Almighty, if he will allow us to sing this wonderful hymn, we will be able to say with confidence and faith and love and utter devotion to our Father, holy, holy, holy. God in three persons, blessed. Trinity. Let us pray. Loving triune God, teach us your children this morning to praise and to glorify you with our lives and all that we have by serving others. God our Father, you have created us in your love, you sin your Son to redeem us, and now he gathers together his holy people by the power of his Holy Spirit. Let us, Father, come to him in the Spirit, through the name of Jesus, and ask him for all that we need. Lord, continue to show yourself to the world by spreading the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, Support all who are preparing for service. Keep us all together in the faith. Encourage your people wherever they are. 
Make them aware that you love them deeply. And may they know the reality of Christ within us and among us. Lord Jesus, you are the wisdom and the word of God. You were there at the beginning of creation, yet you choose to become one of us. We pray for your world wide church. Protect those who are persecuted for bearing your name and bring all people to rejoice in you as their Saviour. O oh, Holy Spirit, you hover over the waters of creation and you came to us in our baptism. And we pray for those whose lives we share, united us in a community of love so that we welcome the stranger and support the struggling, build the strong in faith and in lives of serving others. O oh, Heavenly Father, you are indeed the lover of our souls. You are the redeemer of our lives. You are indeed the faithful one. You are the sovereign God, the almighty one, the all-powerful, the all-gracious, the just and the forgiven Father. Help us this morning to come before you in faith and hope. We pray for your people. For those who are with us this morning who maybe they are struggling with issues of faith, Lord, reassure them in their hearts and give them the certainty of the reality of who you are. For those, Father, who are going through illness, who are recovering from surgery, for those, Father, who are going through treatment, we commit them all into your care. And we just pray, loving Saviour, that you will undertake and comfort them. And for those, Lord, who feel alone, who feel scared, who feel frightened about the future, for those who feel isolated, for those, Heavenly Father, who are grieving the loss of a loved one, who is still very mournful in their hearts, who miss their loved ones dearly, Lord, whoever they are, wherever they are this morning, may thy grace surround them and be with them, May you give them the assurance that you hold all things in the palm of your hand. And so support us in our faith, so that at our life's end, we may be raised to eternal life, to share with all your saints in glory the reality that you are indeed Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And so we come to the end of our service this morning. Again, another wonderful hymn that reminds us of this wonderful doctrine of the Trinity, God the Father of creation, hymn 113.
grow in peace, love and care for one another. And may God, our Creator and Father, Jesus, our Saviour and Lord, and Holy Spirit, our Comforter and Guide, be with you. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, be with you now and always.